Alright guys, welcome back to Valorant News Masters. Tokyo is over. Fanatic walk away with a back-to-back -back championship, winning the lock-in event in Sao Paulo, now winning in Tokyo, becoming undoubtedly the greatest team we have ever seen, to be honest, in Valorant history. Evil Geniuses just fall short. Plenty of other storylines on the day as well. Very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comments. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. Thought this is kind of cool, actually, the Crashies reference. When he took all those guys down off the zip line, right, that's now in the game, actually, as a battle pass player card. Also, we've Gotta mention deadlock, right? So the new agent was revealed yesterday, and um, the gameplay features actually were leaked earlier than the Masters Tokyo event itself. So here we go. These are the four things that she does. The C ability looks like this, kind of a funny, weird. I mean, look, this is just how it goes in Valorant in general. That the first few agents in the game are pretty standard. You look at Brimstone, he's got a Molly, he's got a smoke, it's pretty standard stuff. The more agents you bring in, the crazier they have to get, right? The weirder, the wackier, and you get some things like this. Now I actually think this agent is pretty damn well designed, but um, some of the parts are just like, well, here we go again. So anyway, you can kind of lob this Gravnet grenade, which makes people crouch and move slowly while they're in the vicinity, which is pretty funny to be honest, but that's one thing. This is also a little bit interesting. So chuck this on the wall and it gets, it goes completely invisible. I'm not even sure it's detectable by the enemies, but um, it will go invisible. You can still see it from your perspective. And if an enemy makes enough noise in front of it, then it will detonate and concuss them. So um, pretty difficult to counter, to be perfectly honest. That's one thing. Then you've got the barrier mesh. This is a really interesting piece of equipment, actually, because you can still shoot straight through this. I'm pretty sure there's nothing blocking bullets here. Any projectiles can fly through it, but it blocks character movement. So there's some ways where, let's say, you're trying to defend a site, or let's say you've planted the bomb or something, and you're going to plant out of view from someone from a corner, but they could theoretically swing into the corner and kill you. You drop the barrier mesh down, and they can't walk any further, right? They can shoot, but they can't see you because they can't walk through. So that's definitely interesting. And then you've got the ultimate, which is, this is the one that's caused the most controversy so far. It's called um, Annihilation, right? As you guys can see here on screen. Now, you don't have to bounce this off a wall, but um, basically you've got this big area of effect, and I'm guessing if they're, if an enemy is anywhere in this area of effect, they will get done. They get cocoons, and then they get brought in on this nano wire, slowly but surely into where you launched it from. Once they get there, they immediately perish. So that's the, uh, and immediately people said, well, if you're in a 1v1, so you can get out of this if your teammates shoot it, basically. If you're in the nano wire cocoon, there's nothing you can do, but your teammates can shoot it down. Like, it'll take a few bullets to shoot it, and then they will drop down and they'll be fine. But if your teammates don't shoot you out of the cocoon, then you're dead. And this has been, so this is what it looks like actually in the cocoon, right? So this is from the enemy's point of view, that if they get caught up and brought in like this, then they will, you know, get, okay, distance until 30. You don't lose any health until you die, but, um, you know, you can't see anything, and eventually you're just done for when the ultimate gets you. So I'm not quite sure how powerful this is going to be. This is kind of incredible, though. You can actually, here on Fracture, bank it off the roof, and um, they will get brought up to the ceiling. Now, I don't think they can actually come all the way, just because the game seems to be a bit confused as to what to do here, but if they're high up enough, then when it breaks, they will actually fall down and lose all their health in fall damage, right? So you could potentially use this in certain situations, which would be, I mean, it's kind of remarkable especially in 1v1s. It seems, obviously in 1v1s it's impossible to counter, right? But it does take a little bit of time to prep into fire, it doesn't feel like, if you're in a 1v1, it's not necessarily a guaranteed win. But um, if you find, if say one of you won, you find out where the other person is, then you can probably use it to guarantee the, the win. I don't know. It's going to be interesting for sure. Let's talk Masters then. For a lot of teams, their run is over going into today. It was only two teams left, Fnatic and Evil Geniuses. NRG, their next plan will be going into Champions. So after Masters, which is now, we then have the Ascension qualifiers to look forward to coming up soon. Then the last chance qualifier for the World Championship and then the World Championship itself. That's coming up over the next couple of months or so. Also yesterday, we saw the debut of Team Deathmatch. The many people seem to like the idea of this. It actually went down to 100 to 99 in favor of Team Japan. And as Ten says, the TDM actually looks pretty fun. Gunfights seem more authentic compared to normal Deathmatch. Might be a better warm-up. Also, finally, a way to warm up the Jet Knife. So I definitely think this is going to be better for warming up than traditional warm-up. That's at least my perspective. But you guys might well disagree. Let's get on then to the Grand Final. So Busio dropped a Sue here 
on his walkout, which is very entertaining. He actually talked, you know, before the finals out. You know, he was looking to get revenge, right? These guys, they wanted revenge on Booster and on Fnatic for taking them down previously. But I think going into this grand finals, it was almost a foregone conclusion in some respect what was going to happen here. Fnatic are just straight up too good. And it's insane that this team is even possible. Like, you look at this roster, you think, how is it even... Like, you look at the numbers as well. We'll see the numbers here in a second from the overall tournament. There's only one player on Fnatic that isn't in the top five statistically, which is, it's just absurd. But Evil Geniuses, what a great job they did. They make it all the way to the grand finals. The fact that they've only been a team for not that long, Demon One joined the squad not long ago, all the criticism they took to make it this far. Fnatic, they played Lotus game one, and as expected, Fnatic, they, yeah, you could say they took the easy way out, but they took advantage of their winner's bracket advantage, and they vetoed both Fracture and Pearl. And some would say that's even too much of an advantage. I don't really think so. I think the team from winner's bracket should definitely get an advantage and banning two maps is definitely a big advantage. You can push everything in your favor, but fundamentally, you've still got to actually get the job done. Both all the maps start at 0-0, zero, zero, so I think it is pretty much justified. But um, yes, eventually, the series got interesting. Now, 3 O's results, especially in grand finals, always will feel a little bit underwhelming, right? And I think 3 O's can be great. I mean, we saw Fnatic versus, or sorry, Evil Geniuses versus Paper X, the map five, very exciting. I think to some extent, there is a reason why the um, like Counter-Strike, the mages, they've always done them as best of threes. There's always been a big debate there as to whether best of three or best of five is best. Some players think, oh, you know, best of fives, it's too long. And um, I think best of threes, you'll always get a pretty entertaining match generally. Whereas if a team goes up 2-0, it can be almost feeling like it's going to be over. But I still like best of fives in general. I still think they work well for this type of format. And EG were fighting back. Split was very interesting. EG took the lead 9-8. Eventually, they lost 13-11, I believe, in a very similar way to how they did in their winner's bracket. And then EG found themselves on binds, a map where you think there's no way that they're going to win. But actually, they have a great first half. 8-4 first half. You're thinking, well, EG could actually do something here. But it never felt like that Fnatic were ever going to lose, you know? I don't know if you guys had that feeling watching this as well, that no matter how many rounds Fnatic were down, it always felt like they were just by far the superior team to such an extent that they were going to find a way to win. And that's basically what happened here. They were down 7-11. They had to bring a big comeback here, Fnatic. And they did exactly that. They won all the rounds they needed to win. Took it to overtime, down 12-11. And eventually win 14-12. GG. At least it was competitive in the last couple of maps there in the series. But Fnatic comfortably, by a margin, the best team in the world right now. And they become probably the best team ever, let's be honest. The level they're performing at, the fact that they don't seem to lose to anybody. You can look at, you know, even obviously original Sentinels, but the likes of Optic Gaming and Loud, but Fnatic have surpassed that in my opinion. Chronicle becomes the first ever player to win three international events. He won, of course, with Gambit before. Durka, Boaster, Leo, and Alpha become the only other players to win two international events because Chronicle was the first to win two. Now he's the first to win three. These other guys are now the first to win two and also the first to ever do it back to back. They won the lock in. They've now won Masters Tokyo and, you know, they're obviously going to be massive favorites to win champions as well very shortly indeed a couple of months time so who's going to stop these guys i mean evil geniuses i don't think ever were going to be able to quite do it as a new team getting into that situation it was always going to be a massively tall order for eg of all teams to do it but you've got to give them so much credit right the fact that they've only been playing as demon one says at the tier one level for less than three months placing second at the first international i definitely think they can come back stronger but it does make you wonder who can actually beat fnatic demon one finally <laughs> making it to the site <laughs> Pull yourself together. Oh, it's done. fucking oh, done. It's no. Oh, it's fucking it's done. done. It's no. It's not over. It's not over. Dude, Eo's gonna oh, talk so much. Eo's gonna make fun of us. Oh, he's done. Oh, no. They're gonna say, and why so quiet. No. I mean, Boaster won, though. Hard for Boaster. Is that plus six? That was plus six or seven, right? Yeah, I think so. Another fanatic W. What? What the? What? Wait, is that Kim Doan Mo? That's so sad, bro. Here's the Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Pick it up! Drop the trophy! Tokyo event! Fanatic! Woo! Look at that ass!
<laughs> we know that Liquid did beat Fnatic on home turf, right, to the EMEA, kind of the final event of that one. But um, fundamentally, from an international perspective, didn't matter too much. And yeah, the series was in the end pretty dominant, to be honest. 13-8, 13-11, 13 or 14-12, sorry. So he was quite competitive, but Durka came alive. And also from Durka, he used the raise every single map here. He didn't even use the jet. He didn't even want to bother with that. And it's so scary to think about, actually. I know that Yintu tweeted about this as well, that Durka didn't play jet and Leo didn't even play Sova. So they didn't even really use their best agents here. And they still won the event without much difficulty. And Leo had two first deaths the entire event, which is just such an absurd stat. Like, the entire team is insane. And just looking at the numbers here of the entire event, this is KD and this is rating. Like, let's just look at KD, for example. The top five players are KD. One of them is Kang Kang with a 1.3. Outside of that, you have Alpha with a 1.63. Leo with a 1.47. And uh, Chronicle with a 1.33. And Durka with a 1.18. Like, that is just so ridiculous. Maybe NRG, maybe DRX on their day. You know, maybe there's Paper X with something can actually give Fnatic a go. But it's going to be a seriously tall order. And the other thing this means is that going into Champions, EMEA has another spot, right, as a region. So they will get a couple of teams through. They will have, what, five teams, right, EMEA, from their region through to Champions because two of the teams from their last chance qualify will make it. Vitality won't be attending as we saw a few days ago based on, you know, deciding not to out of respect for Twistin, but, you know, Carmine Corp, they might be in for a run for their money here, right? But what it does mean for Sentinels and for the teams in the Americas and the Pacific, there's only one LCQ slot. So there's only one of those teams that will make it, which is far from optimal for those guys. But yeah, Fnatic again have given their region a bit of a blessing, despite the fact that actually their region was the weakest one of this entire tournament, right? Only two European teams got to the top eight and only one of them got to the top four. But um, still, Fnatic get that region an extra spot and keep on trucking forwards. But very much enjoyed to your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care and I'll see you next time.